Technology Seminar. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Dr. Lisanne Petraka. Uh, Dr. Petraka comes to us from the Department of Rangeland and Wildlife Sciences at Texas A&M Kingsville, where she is an assistant professor of carnivore ecology. Her research focuses on quantitative approaches to inform carnivore ecology and conservation, and she's especially focused on issues related to the recovery of the federally endangered ocelot, a neotropical small felid that is threatened by habitat loss and human-caused mortality. Uh, today, she's going to be talking to us about some of that work. Uh, her, the title of her talk is New Perspectives on Ocelot and Mountain Lion Ecology in the Texas-Mexico Borderlands. Please uh, put your hands together and welcome Dr. Petraka. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I'm guessing you can hear me all right with this fancy microphone. Okay, so let's get started. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here and talk a little bit about what I've been up to over these past 16 months. So a little about me. So as Dan said, I am a new assistant professor of carnivore ecology at the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute and Texas A&M University Kingsville. So I started this position about 16 months ago, so January 2023. So I'm pretty new getting some projects off the ground and yeah, hoping to talk a little bit about progress on those fronts. So um, I am a quantitative and spatial ecologist by trades, so primarily focusing on modeling low density elusive species. So I have worked on things from, you know, the jaguar across Central America to the African lion in Zimbabwe and wolves in Washington and tufted puppet <laughs> tufted puffins in the Aleutians. So kind of a wide range of species. Um, and yeah, as mentioned, my primary role now is to serve as a scientific lead for a big ocelot reintroduction project coming to South Texas. And that is me in the hat. I understand that could be anybody, um, but I swear that is me and that is working up an ocelot during capture season last year. All right. So I will be talking today about the tale of two species. So it's pretty miraculous that, you know, two species um, in South Texas have such widely different management strategies, given that they're both occurring, you know, um, at low densities. So the thing that unites them is that they're both listed as least concern under the IUCN Red List. So neither one of these species is in danger of extinction. Um, however, um, the ocelot is federally listed, so it is an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act, and it is the only extant endangered felid in the US. So mountain lion do have a listed subspecies, the Florida panther, and one can say, well, what about jaguarundi? Um, and they are believed to be extirpated from the United States, though they are still officially listed under the Endangered Species Act. So when it comes to their geographic range, they are vastly different. So ocelots are limited to two populations, both in South Texas, and mountain lions have the largest geographic range of any terrestrial mammal in the Western Hemisphere. So um, pretty different spatial extents of species that I'm working with. And when it comes to numbers, they're both low density populations. Ocelots, we truly have no idea how many there are. There could be likely less than 100 individuals. And in with the mountain lion, they are low density, but there is absolutely no management of them in Texas whatsoever. They are non-game. Um, I told people earlier today that I even tried to apply for a permit with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And they said, oh, no, what don't we, you don't need a permit to study mountain lion for any reason. Just go do whatever you want to do out there. So super, super, super different management. Whereas with ocelots, the fact that they're a listed species doing anything is actually really, really, really hard. And the permitting takes forever. Whereas with mountain lions, you could actually do whatever you want with no oversight whatsoever. 
So again, the tale of two species, ocelots have, um, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, one can say. So we recently landed a contract from US Fish and Wildlife for 12.2 million um, to support ocelot recovery and reintroduction. And there's a lot of players in the game, not just us at Caesar Clayburg, but the East Foundation, which is a private foundation, um, Texas A&M College Station and their Natural Resources Institute and CREW, which is a research division of the Cincinnati Zoo that focuses on um, assisted reproduction um, of felids and other species. Whereas in the mountain lion world, um, there was an influx of funding from US Fish and Wildlife for about 900K, but otherwise no one cares about mountain lions in Texas. No one is interested in studying them for science. There is a lot of interest in shooting them all. Um, but other than that, there is little to no research interest. We are the only player in the game at this point in South Texas. Okay, so for those of you who aren't quite sure what an ocelot is, so they are a medium-sized spotted cat. They weigh between 15 and 35 pounds. Um, and it's native to the southwestern United States, Mexico, Central and South America, and a couple islands in the Caribbean. So if you're interested in the phylogenetics of ocelots, so they diverged, so the Leopardus genus diverged um, from Felidae, Felidae being, meaning like the big cats, like your snow leopards and your lions and your jaguars. Um, they diverged about 8 million years ago. And ocelots diverged from their closest relative, the margay, about uh, two and a half to one million years ago. So um, they are Leopardus pardalis, and um, they are a really unique um, addition to the community um, of South Texas mammals. So this is the historic range, the hatched area. So, and this historic range actually excludes um, Southern Arizona where ocelots also have historically been. And they were also in parts of, um, let's see, is this working? Ooh, yeah, it is. Okay. So in parts of, you know, Oklahoma, Arkansas and Louisiana and, you know, the two, the Eastern two thirds of Texas. And now ocelots are restricted solely um, to Southern Texas. And this range is quite generous. Um, here we have the somewhat reality. So in purple, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Um, in purple is the refuge population. So this is the entirety of the refuge population. So this is federally managed. So I learned today that Utah is 75% public lands, which is really, really amazing. Well, Texas is 95% private lands. So we have it's flipping Utah on its head. So this is um, federally owned land where one of the two ocelot populations is. And in the blue, we have the ranch population. And the reality is that this population extends probably in the area, maybe like four to five times this size to the north and west. However, because it's private lands and landowners are reticent to give any information to the feds about federal spe uh, federally listed species on their lands, um, we are not able to access um, those properties to do any monitoring or surveying. So the one area that we do have at access to is in blue here, and that is a 30,000 acre property that is privately managed. So purple is um, public lands and the blue is private, and we only have access to a proportion of that population. So these populations are only 20 kilometers apart as the crow flies. So that's like pretty close and well within the dispersal distance of the small cat, right? However, genetic analysis that I'll be talking about suggests that there actually has not been any contemporary exchange of genetic information between those two populations due to agricultural development, urbanization. Um, it is considered to be possibly um, isolated in geographic space. So how has this come to pass? How are ocelots now so restricted within the United States? 
Um, the answer is that there has been depletion of tamalipin thorn scrub. So ocelots are habitat specialists and they strongly select for this dense thorn scrub environment. And it's an ecoregion characteristic of Southern Texas and um, Northeastern Mexico. And only 10% of the original thorn scrub um, remains in its natural state. And that is due um, to agriculture, urbanization, industrialization. Um, and so if you're curious, you know, what thorn scrub looks like, you can see it there. That is a trap for ocelots on the right there. And so thorn scrub is characterized by honey mesquite, live oak, uh, guajillo, ebony, wisatch, and prickly pear. Um, walking through this type of habitat is really, really hard. You need to wear leggings and then canvas pants and snake boots. So yeah, they're for rattlesnakes, but really it's to protect against the thorn scrub. It's a really kind of gnarly environment to work in. Um, in fact, our scat dog handler said that she's worked in all you know, um, ecosystems across the US and the most difficult work she'd ever done was in South Texas. So I took that as like a badge of honor or something. Um, so what does recovery look like um, for ocelots in the United States? So this was drafted before my time, but I just have to work with it. So um, the magic number is 200 ocelots, um, 200 ocelots in Texas. And that would be a single meta population of 150 or two populations of 75 that are connected. And then um, an additional 50 kind of anywhere in the state. So 200 ocelots is that magic number that we're trying to shoot for in um, this recovery planning. So my role as a population ecologist is to figure out key things about these populations so that we can not only plot the trajectory, but figure out where we are right now, because I would argue that we know very little about these core aspects of ocelot populations in South Texas. So we would want to know, ideally, you know, abundance, survival, reproduction, and also genetic diversity, not just in one year, but over a longitudinal time scale so that we can get a sense of trends in this population. So I know that a group of you talked about this paper maybe in the last week or so. Um, this is a paper that I put out um, about essentially the ability to combine different data streams to inform models of population dynamics. Um, and essentially, you know, in the past you would use, you know, one data stream to estimate one thing and, you know, that was great. Now you can combine, you know, multiple data streams on survival, on abundance and the birth process um, to estimate multiple parameters simultaneously in the same model, which leads to borrowing of strength, increased precision of parameter estimates. Um, and so this paper that um, we published this year um, included the usual suspects of an integrated population model, but also added in this immigration emigration component and the formation of new territories. And this was actually applied to gray wolves in Washington, um, but the framework can be applied really to any territorial species that is in the process of recolonization. Um, and in this case, following a reintroduction process. So with this type of model, again, sorry to code switch, but we're now on wolves for a brief period. By combining data on pack counts, um, reproduction, and survival, um, you could take those um, data streams and estimate numbers of wolves um, over the data years for which we have information. So this was estimating the number of wolves over about a 10, 11 year period. And you can also estimate number of wolves um, from the point of your last data collection into the future. So we also cast out wolf numbers from 2020 over the next 50 years to 2070. Um, and if this looks a little sketchy, like, wow, your uncertainty is really high. Um, the reality is that if you are properly and honestly accounting for uncertainty and stochasticity, stochasticity in these systems, um, this isn't an unreasonable amount of uncertainty when you're casting out these models over 50 years. So 
um, there is evidence to suggest that yes, wolves will continue to increase in Washington. And we can predict that with quite a bit of certainty. You can also estimate the probability of meeting plan recovery goals. This was for the wolf in Washington. And we can see that they are well on their way to meeting recovery goals if everything stays in the status quo. Um, and you can, and those rules for plan recovery can obviously change based on your species of interest. And then this is a paper that we still have in prep, but you can use different management scenarios like, you know, the baseline situation or translocating individuals or introducing disease, increasing lethal removals, different harvest strategies, or a situation in which immigration into the state is completely halted. And you can see on the y-axis how that affects the probability of meeting plan recovery. And essentially what we found is that the wolf population will be pretty resilient, but if you have a certain amount of additive harvest in green, or if you just cut off that immigration from other states, um, wolves are unlikely to recover um, by year 2070. So thinking about those parameters of interest for ocelots, what we know is that in that refuge population, there are likely less than 20, it has somehow never been formally evaluated, so we do not know how many ocelots are in that refuge population. And in the ranch population, um, in that sliver of, of habitat that we have access to, there are maybe 36 or so with some uncertainty around that estimate. Um, and so uh, as a whole, the density was high, about 17.6 animals per 100 square kilometers. So that is like quite a high density of ocelots in that ranch population. And yeah, in this figure, like the white is where the camera traps were. Um, and you can see that those cameras were placed in that high canopy cover um, habitat, which is where the ocelots uh, pretty much specialize in. So where are we going? So first, obviously, we want a holistic estimate of pop of ocelot numbers within South Texas, but we're also trying to get a bit clever and think about a second data stream, which is genetic data. And can the inclusion of genetic data help increase our precision of estimates of ocelot density? So we will be using camera traps, no surprise. And we're also using now um, scat detection dogs um, to detect scat um, of ocelots, also of bobcats. And we're seeing you know, what happens when we combine this detection, non-detection data with our presence only um, to get at numbers of ocelots in this environment. So as of now, um, we have purchased 500 cameras and we're looking to increase to 750. Um, we have two technicians whose full-time job is to deploy these camera traps and we're looking to cover both populations and to be able to estimate density as, as well as we can. And some of these cameras are placed in really dense thorn scrub that's really hard to get to. And those technicians are really, um, kicking butt out there and hopefully will lead to, to a nice density estimate for ocelots in these areas. Um, when it comes to these scat dogs, um, they are specially trained to pick up on ocelot and bobcat scat. And the whole idea is that the shedding of epithelial cells by the animal means that DNA can be extracted from the scat so that you can identify individuals and then use that um, in your traditional kind of density models um, based on the identification of individuals. So this was our dog, Benny. And Benny apparently has a statue dedicated to him at the Woodland Park Zoo. So he's a famous scat detection dog. We were lucky to have him. And so this is a video that I hope works. And I'll explain the cowbell in a second. So that was a short snippet of the scat detection dog at work. And so the dog would go into the thorn scrub here and there when, when he picked up a scent. Um, so I'm sure you're noticing the long line, which might be unusual for those of you who are used to working with scat dogs, and also the use of the cowbell. So um, that is a safety measure because on hour one of day one, our 
second scat detection dog not pictured was attacked by a javelina or a collared peccary and gave it a huge laceration in its leg, required a trip to the emergency vet. It was a whole to do. And being a new PI and trying, you know, we'd worked for so hard to get these scat detection dogs here. And then in hour one, utter disaster, blood everywhere. I thought the dog, the, the dog is completely fine and is healed, but um, not the greatest start to the project. Um, and though we, we adjusted and we put in these safety measures and we did not have another incident um, for that, the duration that they were with us. So the cowbell was meant to keep those javelina at bay and we did not have another incident. Um, so here we have, you know, where we did the scat dog transects in black and where we had positive scat in red. And so the team did 150 kilometers of sampling over 60 hours and only found 20 scat. And that's combining both ocelot and bobcat. I think we were hoping for a lot more um, and we have some ideas about what we could do differently next time. So apparently by running the dogs in March, it was a little too hot. When they are panting a lot, they can't smell as well. So that could have impacted things. Also, we only train the dogs on fresh scat, like really, really fresh scat. And so it could be that we needed to train these dogs on a greater variety of kind of like desiccation level. Um, and that would maybe, we would pick up more signal I and mean, then also possibly getting these, these animals more further um, into the thorn scrub to kind of increase that radius. Because we think that ocelot scat likely wouldn't be on that thorn scrub perimeter, likely deeper into that habitat. So we're going to try things a bit differently next time. And um, when it comes to survival, um, we do want to estimate this using GPS collars. So thus far, we've collared eight ocelots and 23 bobcats across these two populations. This work um, was done prior to my arrival. So this is from Blackburn 2021. So at the refuge, um, residents had a higher survival than transients, transients being those that don't have like an established home range yet. Um, and essentially what's happening here is that 40% of our radio collared ocelot fatalities are occurring due to roads. So here is the refuge population and then the green are the low volume, orange are the high volume. And yeah, just a lot of fatalities due to vehicles. And in fact, if you look at this like um, circular road here on the refuge, this was actually shut down to the public because tourists killed an ocelot. So they come to see an ocelot and they wind up accidentally running over it. So that road has since been shut down. Um, and in general, roadkill is, um, is a serious issue um, for a population that's already numbering few individuals. Um, so we, I think I have one more point here. So the ranch population, it has never been formally estimated ever. So obviously what we'd like to do is get a better sense of survival across these two sites and do a little bit more, um, have some more flair in our analyses um, to expand um, to a more multi-state model where we can within the same model estimate survival of animals, male, female, and then the disperser versus the resident state rather than kind of separating animals into either you know, disperser or resident and doing things that way. And reproduction. So we know already that litters do consist of one or two kittens. Um, and that first year survival is around 0.7. However, this ocelots were only monitored up to three months of age. And this data set is dating back to the 80s and 90s. So it's kind of like a ripe time to kind of try to get at this parameter again. Um, and so to do this, to really assess reproduction, reproduction success, kitten survival, we are pulling a page out of the Julie Young playbook. Um, and we are using these, whoa, that's not what I meant to do. Um, these neonate collars here um, that can communicate with the mother's collar. So this is similar if not uh, identical to the work that Kristen Ingebretson did with mountain lions here in Utah. And the goal is that these collars um, can communicate via VHF with the mother's collar, um, such that it doesn't require intensive VHF monitoring um, at the den sites. 
And so, you know, every period it'll, the mother's collar will transmit whether or not that kitten is alive or dead. So we can assess survival that way. And you can pair up to two kitten collars with every female collar. So this study, so I have a recruited student, we've identified an ocelot den, we're on our way, but we do not have the federal permitting in place to be able to do anything. So we have the equipment, we have the team, we're ready to go, but we can do nothing at this moment and it may be a full year before we can. So this is just an example of, you know, you have these ideas, you have the team, you have the equipment and you can't quite do it yet. So that's an interesting part of being kind of a new PI. Here is a cool video of a mother ocelot playing with its kittens. So what's really interesting about this is that this kitten is now the lactating female that we have a collar on who has established a den and has her own kittens and we cannot go in and assess the situation. Um, but it's really cool, circle of life. So now this kitten on this video is now um, grown and has kittens of her own. And here's another video um, of the same kitten mother combination. And in this video, the mother has brought the kitten a prey item. And then this video isn't as long. The kitten just kind of plays with it. And, and that's the end of the video, but it's pretty cool. And that's it. <laughs> so yeah, just really, really cool insights that you can gain um from kind of pursuing this reproduction piece um yeah our our mothers that have more experience giving birth are they more successful mothers do they have a higher level of kitten survival there's so many cool questions that we can answer and largely inspired by julie young's work here at usu so genetically things aren't so great so there is um significant genetic differentiation between the ranch and refuge populations which is then significantly divergent from northeast mexico so these three populations are becoming increasingly genetically dissimilar um and the lowest diversity was in that refuge population that federally managed population um, so things aren't looking too hot from a genetic standpoint. However, this work was last done over one ocelot generation ago. Um, so there is a need for an update. And what I found really interesting was that this divergence um, was comparable to felid populations that had recently undergone like a severe bottleneck. Um, and so that is what we believe is occurring in the ocelot population. And let's remember, these populations are separated by 20 kilometers. 20, that is not far. That is within the dispersal distance of an ocelot. And to that end, I am finally able to like talk about this. It was kind of being kept hush-hush for a while. But this ocelot named Lewis, I do not approve of giving uh, human names to wildlife, but I'm one of, of many people on this team. So this, this ocelot's name was Lewis. He was captured last year by our team in the ranch population, and just this year was found in the refuge population. So this individual was able to run the gauntlet, and that is the first documentation of movement between the two populations since monitoring began in the 80s. So a part of the question is like, had there been ocelots exchanged, but we just didn't have the ability to tell possibly, but the genetic analysis would have possibly revealed that. So that suggested, man, there's a serious bottleneck occurring. These populations are pretty much getting bottlenecked, isolated. And then we have this individual that is just like naturally translocating. So we don't know how common an event this is, we hope that this cat stays alive long enough to actually reproduce in this area and exchange that um, genetic material. All right, so genetics, we have a couple things going on. Um, we're using next gen sequencing, getting into the genomics realm. 
um, to determine the genomic diversity in the current day um, and the timing of that bottleneck. We do have samples from 34 unique individuals captured over the past seven years. And we're also comparing divergence in the genome between wild and zoo sourced ocelots. And that is um, really for um, the captive breeding program that I'll talk about. Um, essentially, like, what is that ideal mixing of genetic material between wild and zoo sourced? You know, you want to promote genetic exchange. You don't want to promote outbreeding depression, where you could be introducing genetic material into this population from individuals that aren't adapted to um, specific features of this environment. So it's an interesting tightrope to walk. And we do have 35 samples from zoo sourced ocelots from across the country. Um, there are genetic indivi generic individuals, which are sourced from Central America um, and Northern South America, and then 16. Um, which are coming from the br more Brazilian um, subspecies. And then a question on directionality of disease transmission. So what's really interesting is where the ranch population is, there is a domestic cat population directly adjacent. And so we are wondering um, if diseases that are present in domestic cats could be transmitted to ocelots via the general, whoa, via the generalist bobcat. So we're using an apathogenic virus common in felids called feline foamy virus. It's my new favorite name for a virus, feline foamy virus, um, where we're determining we can, you know, sequence that virus if it is detected and build this phylogenetic tree and determine, you know, is, does a spillover event into bob, into ocelots, does it actually come from bobcats, or perhaps bobcats are a non-competent host and are buffering ocelots from this, from this virus. So that is something that I'm working on. Um, I know some of you are much better at this than I am, so I'd love to talk to you if you have ideas how to improve um, where we are at this point. Um, at this moment, we are in the trapping phase and hoping that there's, um, that we can detect the virus and that we can get contacts among collared individuals. So there is significant investment from fish and wildlife to reintroduce ocelots to this area, particularly in the establishment of a third wild population um, and to protect private landowners. There is this programmatic safe harbor agreement such that on their properties, their land use does not have to change and they can return at any point to a zero baseline. So they can wipe out all the ocelots on their property with no repercussions whatsoever. Um, and so this was spearheaded by a private foundation with a lot of land holdings in the area. And it's really to get people on board and um, being comfortable with the idea of having a listed species on their property so that there is, there is no penalty. They don't have to change their land use whatsoever. Um, when if these if these ocelots establish on their property. There is a $10 million captive breeding facility coming to Texas A&M University Kingsville. So um, this facility will have um, a captive breeding area to house the breeders and their dependent young. And then, um, and that's, whoa, keep doing that. That's what this is. And then over here are the rewilding pens. They're each about a half acre. Um, and those are large open air enclosures um, with native vegetation, live prey, minimal human contact. Um, I would say we're probably uh, two to three years off um, actually having animals at this facility. Um, and I can talk about that later. But we don't have time in this talk. So there is a lot of momentum for ocelot recovery in the US. I feel like I've joined um, this team at like a really opportune time. Reintroduction should result in a third wild ocelot population. Um, and my job is to rigorously assess these demographic rates such that we can assess not only, you know, where the population is headed in the future, but where they are right this second. Um, and so that was the ocelot part. I'll, I do have a few slides on the mountain lion work that is really, really, really fascinating stuff and working in a system and a species that no one really has any interest in whatsoever. So 
Mount lion, so we know, puma, cougar, catamount, panther, um, native, uh, large cat native to the Americas, um, second in size only to the jaguar. And so it's found from the Canadian Yukon all the way down to the Andes um, in Patagonia. Um, so just a wide ranging species. Um, and in Texas, so it is the only state with breeding populations that does not have regulated management. So I know here in Utah last year, there was a law passed where, you know, there's no longer um, bag limits that they can be harvested at will. The difference in Texas is that they are just not protected. They're just non-game. There is just no management at all, at all, at all. You can take them by any means necessary and any quantity necessary. Um, and there are two populations in Texas. So one is the Trans-Pecos. This is, you know, where Big Bend is. And there's, you know, just a pretty robust population of lions there. And where I am and where our research is, is in that South Texas population here. So um, what's interesting is that Texas Parks and Wildlife finally has had enough pressure to come up with a draft management plan. So again, this is just a really opportune time to be doing this kind of work. So they have this commission, sorry, more, more like a stakeholder group composed of researchers, landowners, um, houndsmen, um, trappers, uh, private wildlife biologists to come up with um, a management plan that is sound for this species. And turns out they have no data to base that management plan on. So hence where we come in. So here is where mountain lions have been spotted in Texas over the past 10 years. This is by no means any form of abundance estimate. This is just like reports from the public where we can consider this like a proxy of, of possibly um, abundance. And we can see that where the Trans-Pecos population is looking pretty good, you know, down here, which is the study area where we are, um, there are um, very few over, and this is again, over 10 years, um, there are few uh, official reports of mountain lion and we know they're there and we know that they are getting uh, shot upon site. So the last radio calling of mountain lions was nearly 30 years ago in this area, which is along the Nueces River and actually a bit further north than where we ourselves are trapping. So it was nearly 30 years ago. Um, genetic work was last conducted, you know, based on data from about 15 years ago. And surprise, surprise, the lowest genetic diversity across Texas and New Mexico um, was in South Texas. So again, we're dealing with this population that is um, losing genetic diversity and becoming spatially and genetically isolated from other mountain lion populations. Huh, and there's also um, a pretty big issue um, occurring for large mammals in this part of Texas. Um, and that is the establishment of the border barrier system. Um, for, for our contract, we cannot call it the border wall. It is the border barrier system and it is 30 feet um, steel walls. Um, and so we know fencing in general represents a pretty serious obstacle um, to animal movement. I would argue that this wall is possibly the most extreme example of how um, a fence or a wall can impede movement. Um, and the state intends to cover literally hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles of the border with this 30 foot tall system. So here in black is where the barrier currently exists. So there's a lot particularly in this area. And then there's new state wall here and here by Nuevo Laredo. And then it's going to be built here. Um, one of our ranches, they're about to put in 30 miles of state wall. So pretty, pretty serious um, impacts um, that this wall may have. So in comes the South Texas line project where our goals are to determine the impacts of the border barrier system on line movements, on uh, abundance and gene flow. Um, and we have access to 300,000 acres of privately owned land at present. And so um, this funding opportunity weirdly has a focus on these four counties where lions are actually probably non-existent um, but that is where the funding, um, the funding ask is, is being focused on.
but we are focusing our live trapping in these three counties here. And then in um, all counties, we are going to be placing camera traps um, at broad scales to determine overall lion presence. So in the green, we're doing live trapping. And in the orange and green, um, we are going to be doing camera trapping for like large scale distribution um, of this species. So we have already collared um, two adult males. Um, one was about three, one was about two, um, and they were collared in February and they are both still alive, which is something because um, there isn't a lot of lion sign in those areas where we're actively trapping. Um, the people I have on the job say that they have never worked in a system with such low density of lions and that, um, yeah, it's just pretty miraculous that these cats are still alive. There's word on the street that they're not being shot because they have collars on. So that's also uh, something to think about. So we may need to exclude these cats from the survival analysis and just focus on you know, how, they're, how they're moving through space. Um, so when it comes to abundance, we're using the cameras, we're using you know, marks on the individuals on both the collar and on their ear tags. And for those of you who work in density estimation, using a partially marked uh, model um, to estimate um, density of these individuals, though they are seriously at such low density, I have no idea how we're gonna get these models to work. Uh, we're just not catching um, unique individuals on camera. Um, and we think that it could be a sink where they're just all getting uh, shot. Um, so when it comes to movements, we, have GPS collars on these individuals and they are collecting one point every hour. However, when they are near the Rio Grande, when they are near um, the US-Mexico border and therefore the border wall, it collects a fix every, um, every 10 minutes. So we're getting really fine scale movement when these animals are near um, the border wall uh, where it exists and more generally um, near the Rio Grande. And so I have a PhD student focusing on the movement ecology of lions um, when confronted with the wall, not just the wall, but also low and high fencing that is really common across these private ranch lands. And so we're interested in, you know, are these lions gonna do the quick cross? Can they just find a way, especially over the low fences? Um, are they gonna do kind of that trace movement where they're following, following and trying to find a place to cross? Are they gonna do a bounce? Um, so we were inspired. Um, by Wen Jing's work um, on how to kind of quantify um, that behavior when confronted with a barrier. Okay, so here's a cool GIF. So there's a lion moving, 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 and it crosses into Mexico. Um, so of our two cats, this one is a dual citizen of the United States and Mexico and is this, I just had Chloe pull this one out, but it continually crosses the border. Um, and so this, however, is not the border wall. So what I learned from Chloe is this is the border wall. So the border wall ends here and it's going to be continually constructed here. So if this wall continues, which it will, um, this animal may be kind of restricted to that Mexico side and will not be, have the ability to disperse into South Texas and contribute to um, the genetic pool there. Um, so what's interesting is um, they did put in 8.5 by 11 inch crossings at the base of the wall every quarter mile for lions. Um, I calculated that the skull of a lion can fit through that opening. And so I've heard this multiple times now, if they can fit their head through, they can fit their body through. Just two days ago, I tried to put my PhD student through there and he said that he could have three years ago, but not now. Um, so this is meant to be kind of a wildlife crossing. Um, they're placed in really weird place. I mean, it's literally every quarter mile, um, you know, Mount, mountain lions like to cross, you know, where it's vegetated near drainages. This ain't it. So I do not know that any mountain lion would ever use a crossing structure in this kind of environment ever. Um, but we will see. We will see. And gene flow, of course, you know, the whole question is to what extent the lions in South Texas are being sourced from Mexico in order to show that, hey, this wall could actually, could possibly have a detrimental impact. We need to show 
that there is genetic continuity between Mexico and South Texas. To that end, we are doing another genomic analysis um, with samples from South Texas, West Texas, and New Mexico. We have you know, 15 sample kits on the Mexican side. The big problem that we're having is it took me until like three months ago to realize that mountain lions are CITES Appendix 2. So you do need to go through the whole permitting process, get the export permit from the Mexican side and the import permit from the American side, and it can take forever. So if any of you have experience on how to get biological samples across borders, come talk to me because the Mexico piece is a really important part of this picture. Um, and we just don't know how um, we're also, oh, maybe if we get the genetic material analyzed over there and then we combine forces somehow, we're working through all options. So take home points is that our big, big focus um, as funded by Fish and Wildlife is to determine if the border barrier system impacts line movements, abundance, and gene flow. It could be that it doesn't, especially given that there are currently gaps in that construction of the border barrier system. But as you know, one property alone, they're putting in 30 miles of border wall. So if that continues, um, it is likely to have implications on movement and may take a couple generations to actually see that genetically. Um, and also just in general, we know so little, there is so little research interest um, when it comes to lions in South Texas that establishing that scientific baseline is another big reason for us doing what we're doing. Um, and I did want to close with the fact um, that, you know, for both of these species, you know, they're super low density, um, but they have such wildly different management. Um, and we still don't know so much about both. Um, and so it's just a really, really fascinating world to be in, working with a you know federally listed habitat specialist and then this generalist that's wide ranging, but super imperiled in South Texas um, and having to work in both of those spaces on largely private lands. So. It's an interesting, it's a, an interesting world to be working in. Um, and of course, I couldn't do anything that I do without having a great team. Um, so this was my team in the fall and we've grown even more. And um, I'm really grateful for them helping me get this work done. Um, if you have any questions on my talk or on my work, you can find me through email. I'm also on X and Blue Sky. If anyone is still using Blue Sky, I have no idea. Um, and I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you so much.